Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Modern Software Management, uh, modsoftman.com on the web and the channel at modsoftman on YouTube. Today, I want to talk about uh, estimation. Uh, last time, I talked about uh, a planning kind of approach, very basic planning kind of approach where, and I showed you this kind of very basic plan where it shows that uh, there's a number of coders, uh, we apply some days off and a factor to get the number of days of coding equivalents available, say 164 in any three months period. And then we looked at uh, a three month amount of work. We looked, you roughly estimated the days it would take to work on each item in the plan. And you came up with a number and that came out to about 80% of available. And so that's kind of pretty feasible. And then as you work your way through that plan, uh, you would continuously update the days remaining. And of course the days available would be decreasing as well because the work days would be decreasing as you go. But I was very vague about this days notion and about how do you come up with these numbers like item seven taking 12 days or whatever days means. Before we start about software, like what does it mean to just estimate something in general? I was kind of inspired by Einstein, actually. Um, I was a physics geek when I was a kid, and I knew all about special relativity. And Einstein, in defining special relativity, had to define what he meant by length. And so he says he's got a standard rod of a, of a, of a material that won't deform. And length is the number of these rods you can stack next to each other. And that's your measure of your length. So he defined very precisely what he meant by quantities by defining how you would kind of in an operational sense actualize it. So when we estimate something, say we uh, look, we want to estimate someone's uh, height or someone's weight, you know, that's a very meaningful estimate. Uh, you know, I estimate that that person is six foot one inches tall. Um, I know what I'm estimating because I know how I'd measure it. I you know, put him up against the wall and put a book on his head and draw a little line and then take a tape measure and say, oh, is it six foot one or is it six or is it whatever? What is the actual value? So I know exactly what I'm estimating because I'm specifying kind of at least implicitly how I would measure it. Same thing for weight. We have bathroom scales. You can weigh people. But even there, it gets a little tricky. When I'm estimating a weight, is that, uh, well, I don't want to be risque, but is that like without any clothes on weight, for instance? Is it? the weight in the morning or in the afternoon, and that can actually make a, a, a five pound difference one way or the other. So, but if you specify, you know, what's estimate the person's weight naked first thing in the morning, okay, uh, now we know how to measure something. So we know more precisely what we're trying to uh, estimate. You think you have precise concepts, like let's measure how strong, estimate how strong that person is. Take a look at this person. Let's estimate how strong that person is. So how would you go about estimating how strong somebody is, for instance? How do you measure that? What do you mean by strength? Is it like how much you can lift or can you lift cars? Or Here's one way. Uh, you know, there's a, a carnival game like this where you swing a mallet and it hits this. And this is some kind of a strongman game. And uh, your strength is how far up the little thing goes. If it goes up to seven. That's how strong you are. If you go past 10, you ring the bell and you win a prize. So as soon as you say, well, that's how we're going to measure somebody's strength is by having them do this. And you say, okay, now I kind of know what I'm estimating now. Uh, I know I know that I'm estimating, uh, you know, a bunch of things, not, not only kind of how strong, but also how fast their muscles are, kind of how big they are, how coordinated they are. You know, I'm doing all sorts of things together with that uh, measure at the same time as I'm doing that measure, right? So, so but getting back then to, to software, the question of, of software is, well, how do we measure um, how do we measure the size of software? You know, software, you're, you're implementing some requirements. Say you've got a software system and you're asked to go in and enhance it in a certain way. That, that relates to how do you measure it after you've done it? If you've done it, then measure it, and then we'll see. So, there's various ways proposed of measuring the size of software. Uh, you know, a very naive approach 
which is used a lot and has a certain amount of place, is the number of lines of code that are written. So you would specify how to count lines of code. Maybe comments aren't included, white space is not included, but normal statement boundaries according to a certain format are, and you count up the number of lines of code that were produced in order to implement a feature. So that's a very reasonable way of sizing software. And certainly it's meaningful. Like if you could do something in, in 50 lines of code or if something took 5,000 lines of code, chances are that's a pretty good indicator. But it has all sorts of weaknesses, that approach, especially when you're, um, especially in this day and age where often it's about finding the right library to bring in and use. And then you could do either do something with like a lot of lines of code and risk a lot of bugs, or you could do something with few lines of code and bringing in just the right library uh, that is probably going to be more correct than the code you write yourself. So, so which of those two would you prefer as your solution? Well, the smaller one, but bringing in that library, you might've had to do a lot of research. You didn't know how that library works. You had a choice of 10 different libraries you could have used. Um, you tried using it and you ran into problems. So then you had to learn more about it or maybe you had to dig into the source code. And plus as I, I've also had many cases where uh, the net result is eliminating lines of code uh, because you're asked to like something that is like terribly messy. You had to refactor it down to something small and then add the feature on top. So you could kind of say, well, okay, this many lines were deleted and then this many were added afterwards as a, as a measure of the amount of work done. But, but often it, it, it's a very unsatisfying kind of metric because um, you know it doesn't completely correlate with with the size of the thing and estimating the lines of code is almost more difficult than estimating you know what I actually recommend you estimate which is actually time uh, now there's other approaches to measuring software size that have been proposed something like uh, function points for instance so here is, for instance, you know, a spreadsheet where you um, you look at the number of inputs and outputs and transformations and user interfaces and database tables and all sorts of things like that, and you give them points and then you scale them in various ways based on complexity and come up with some kind of inherent that's called function point analysis. So that's a thing as well. That's the thing that people have done, but but again, very difficult. You know, it doesn't cover all the situations, especially with modern software, the way you want to cover them. Like, I want to implement some kind of a neural net type of thing. It's, you know, wow, that that doesn't really account for it in any significant way whatsoever. I think the the most straightforward approach, and, and the way a lot of the industry approaches it, is, you know, there's kind of four things that go into use time. There are four things that go into any time based estimate. Let's see. The inherent, this fuzzy notion of the inherent size of the work item is certainly one thing. Um, a guess of who is going to work on it. A guess of how productive that person will be working on that thing. Those are all tied up together. And those three are really hard to tease apart. And the fourth thing is, you know, if you're using calendar-based days, it's like, well, how much dedicated time will the person have to devote to that thing, right? But the dedicated time, you can kind of break that out. You can break out an estimation of how much dedicated time something someone has to work on something, and you can measure that after the fact. You just ask them to record their time working on the thing, and then you can figure out over the last two weeks, on average, each work day, how many hours were they able to contribute to that thing. And then uh, that then you can estimate for the remainder of the project approximate. And, and if there's anything that's going to change that you ask the person to re-estimate that as you go. So I call that estimate a work factor. I use the letter little w for it. So you arbitrarily define like a work day to consist of eight hours. Uh, a w of 0.5 means they're doing eight times 0.5 or four dedicated hours working on the thing per each workday. So you exclude weekends and statutory holidays and vacations, but for all those other days, you average that all up together. So, you know, over the measurement period, you look at the dedicated hours where they work on the thing and divide by eight times the work days during that period, which excludes those things. And that's how you measure after the fact a work factor. So that means you can estimate a work factor for somebody. 
And then later on, you can measure to see how good your estimate uh, is, basically. Um, so if you take out that thing, which is fairly easy to take out and easy to measure, uh, you are you're come back to the three things that get intermingled tied together. The inherent size of the work item, who will work on it, how productive that person will be working on it. When you bundle up all those three things, I call the uh, resulting estimation unit the effective coder day. So one effective coder day is the same as eight ideal hours of coding. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Why eight? You know, eight, eight solid hours is a pretty jacked work day, I have to admit, but I'm calling it kind of some sort of idealized version. You can kind of imagine getting in the flow state for eight solid hours and imagine how much you would do uh, in that flow state. You'll never achieve that generally, but, uh, but the other big reason for eight is it's two times two times two. So, you know, a half an ECD is four hours, a quarter of an ECD is, is two hours. So just a little bit convenient doing it that way. So what does kind of the ideal hour means? It's like no zero interruptions at all. And again, imagining yourself in that total flow state, that's, that's the ideal aspect of it. What does coding mean in this context? Well, it's, it's individual contributor work by a coder related to the specific in-plan features. So not if they're working on other things that aren't in your plan, that, that doesn't count. Um, if it's not individual contributor work, if it's going to meetings, even meetings about the features you're working on, I'm arbitrarily not counting that at all. But beyond that, it's individual contributor work uh, dedicated to that feature that's in plan. So it's, perhaps it's just a lot of thinking. Um, Perhaps someone likes to write a document, for instance. Uh, maybe someone else likes to code up a prototype and throw it away and do it again. Whatever that factor is, that's the individual time. Uh, some of these definitions are a little bit arbitrary. You just have to settle on one, whatever that is, and that's the one that I generally uh, settle on. Um, so as I say, you know, but how about if there's a lot of time in meetings? Well, I'm kind of assuming that's a small amount of time, and I'm kind of assuming that it's got a relatively fixed ratio, no matter what you're working on, and it's not usually important, and it's accounted for, it decreases your work factor if you've got a lot of meetings. So someone who tends to be meeting heavy will have a lower work factor, but hopefully, because that's their process, they make up for it by being more productive in the ideal hours that they have. Someone else may, may be different in that one. And then, of course, the first thing people ask is, wait, it's not just coders, how about other essential people? like?" managers, for instance, uh, testers, publications people, product managers, architects who don't code. I don't like those, but whatever. Uh, release managers, things like that. Again, and the idea is you keep those folks in some ratio to the coding resource. So say you got 20, for every 20 coders, you have one publications person. Uh, for every 20 coders, you have uh, one and a half managers, something like that. So you always keep those ratios. And if you find, oh, there aren't enough managers, I don't know how that happens, then you might change that ratio. If there's not enough like publications people, you might change that ratio to, to or, or you know, if you find you have too many and they're going idle, you decrease the ratio, things like that. Um, but the coding work by these coders, that tends to be the scarce resource. It tends to be where the rubber really hits the road. You really need the code to be written for the feature to function at all. And so that's kind of, but you know, how much documentation do you need? How much auxiliary testing beyond what the dev does themselves do you need? How much managing do you need? Those are pretty arbitrary things. I find ratios work just fine for estimating those things and kind of focus on that individual contributor work by coders, but whoever, you know, so if a manager contributes to the coding, you include them and with a low work factor because they're not doing that much coding, uh, they're doing more managing. I I hope every estimate is really a probability distribution. So say this might be a probability distribution here for a certain feature where, you know, the, the area is equal to one by definition. And what you can do um, is you, is you draw out in complete detail. This is my complete understanding of all the uncertainties in this as well. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's not going to take more than 120 hours at like probability. It certainly won't take more than like one, like less than one hour. So it disappears on that side too, like that. 
And you know, the way you can ask questions, like if you have this distribution, and I'm gonna say in a minute why it's impossible to have it, but if you had it, you say, you know, the chances it'll be between 45 and 75 hours is like 40%, or the chances it'll be greater than 75 hours is 30%. So you can, but um, it's of course unreasonable and silly to ask people for the whole curve. I just think it's a useful thing to understand. Well, that's what an estimate really is. Um, but it might be reasonable to ask for two numbers, and then you can fit what's called a parametric distribution, like a normal distribution, a bell-shaped thing, or a log normal. I'll show you one of those in a second. And then you just need two numbers to fully define that distribution. So, okay, what's the 10% best case? Let's say, well, you know, everything goes perfectly. I think I could do it in 10 hours. What's the 90% worst case? Well, if everything goes terribly wrong, it'll take me 100 ideal hours. If I have those two numbers, I can fit a parametric distribution, like a, a, a non-skewed parametric distribution, like a normal or a log normal. So that's what you know, a normal distribution would look like. They, they tend to have equal probability on the plus and minus. And this is like a log normal uh, distribution here where I find log normals probably model software better where the estimate you're getting is, is you know, around this level here. And there's a, there's a chance it might come in less than that, but it drops quickly. Uh, but the chance it could go on forever is, is significant uh, again. But I, I honestly, in my career, even that level has proven to be impractical. You know, you, you could ask for a little more practical. You could ask for like one number, like what's your 80% worst case estimate? And then say, and what's your estimate of, how sure you are of that? Are you, are you, are you quite certain? So you have low variability. Are you medium certain, or are you totally uncertain? So you have high variability, and then you can fit one of three different log normal curves, or even more practical. Just give me the eighty percent worst case, and I'll assume a medium variability log normal. What does it even mean, though, to uh, these probabilities? I mean, they're like I say, I've I've tried to use them in my career. I, I've never successfully done it. it. It's always been too difficult. It's hard enough to get one number out of a coder. Um, it's really tough to get two numbers or any sense of the uncertainty because they'll all just say, oh, it's terribly uncertain for the most part. Um, but I found it, actually, it doesn't matter that much at all uh, because the main point of an estimate isn't that first estimate. The first estimate could be like really loose. It's the fact that as you put more and more and more work into the thing, the estimate becomes less and less and less dodgy until at the very end when you're you know very close to being finished it you you know you're you you really know how long it's going to take so it doesn't matter what the distribution is shaped like initially uh, it may be weird shaped and really spread out as you know more and more that that kind of tightens up and it drifts to maybe here and then tightens up and then that's your new estimate uh, around there so that's Kind of the process, but that only works if you continuously gather new information uh, in. So, what I mean by that is, is say you know we've got uh, two phases. We've got kind of a pre-planning phase, and then we're bang. Now we're we've started that software project, and we're into our planning horizon. What happens is then we've got this notion of converging accuracy. So you start out way before you know when you're still formulating your plan are we going to even do something? And you might have a very loose definition of that. You might have only like a one sentence definition of it. So even the requirements aren't at all clear about what exactly you're going to be doing. So you ask for a quick and dirty estimate. It may be like 50% off. You know, that might, might be a very wide, broad distribution around it. Uh, it's tough to get developers to commit to that uh, because they think they're going to be held accountable. If you say, well, how long is it going to take to do this? And they say, well, you haven't even specified what this is. I don't even know how I'm going to do it. Uh, and I said, well, look, no, just take your best guess as to what it is. Take your best guess as to how you're going to do it. Take your best guess as to who is going to work on it if it's not you. And just give me your best guess. And they say, no, I refuse. And then so I, I as a manager, I do. So I say, okay, is it going to take like 100 ECDs? And they say, no, that's ridiculous. Well, okay, okay, thanks. Is, is it going to take five ECDs. No, that's ridiculous also. That's way too short. So, so what, 20, 30? Okay, maybe 35. Thank you. Thank you. I write down 
35 next item, something like that. So uh, that's that initial quick and dirty, are we even considering it kind of estimate. Um, if we get further on and we're likely to include it, we might have a little meeting about it. Uh, let's flesh this out a bit. What do we mean by that? And then we refine our estimate up or down and it probably gets a little tighter. We decide, okay, we're definitely doing it. Uh, so define it even better. Have a, like a like a 60 minute work breakdown meeting where we kind of really decide what the requirements are and we spec out everything that needs to get done. And now we're getting more and more accurate. Uh, now you assign a coder to it and that coder has put in a couple of ECDs on that thing. And they now, oh, now I get it. I see what's ahead of me. So now my estimate for what's remaining after those two ECDs is even better. Like maybe now you're down to plus or minus 20%. Halfway through, you've got a really good idea. The coder has a really good idea. They're maybe down to, you know, uh, plus or minus 10%. And of course, you're when you've uh, delivered it, you've delivered it. So what does it mean? I was going to say, what does it mean to deliver code? So oh, I have a rule for that. It's when you ask the coder, is there anything that you know needs to be done for you to be happy with this feature? Uh, and if they say, oh, you know, I've done everything except I've got some like robustness error checking code I need to add in. Oh, okay, sorry, we're not done. Uh, yeah, no, I've done everything, but I'd like to go back and add a few unit tests. You say, like, are those like optional unit tests or like, have you done no unit testing or you know, those optional unit tests? Say, no, 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 I've done a lot of unit testing. I'd be more comfortable with a bit more. No, okay, you're done. But if they say, yeah, no, I've done a crappy job on any test. I've got like one test. I, I need to add more. Okay, you're not done. So it's So it's kind of very binary. Now, what happens is after you're done, if someone else starts using your stuff and they discover, they could discover all sorts of things wrong with it. You know, like you missed the requirement entirely uh, or, or no, it doesn't work or I found a bug or something like that. So you'll be coming back and fixing it some more after that point. But that's really hard to predict and I don't even try to. Um, I use more, again, a method of ratios for that tail end work. I just try to get to that point where the developer believes that they're finished. So, so that's the that's the notion of, of, of how an estimate converges to accuracy. So I, I wanted to show how this kind of plays out a little bit. So if remember, if we go back to our plan, so recall this plan uh, that we had and say there's an item like item seven that was estimated to be 12 ECDs. So Let's say now we start in on that and we start gathering some, some, some data regarding that thing. And so the developer keeps a time log. This is the work day. It takes about 27 work days. Um, the initial estimate is here. It's 12 up there. And uh, so the total of the work done to date and the remaining estimate is therefore 12. So after, um, you know, after a few days, after uh, four days, uh, they put in a total of two ECDs. And the estimate for the remaining time is 13. Notice 13 plus two is now 15, right? That, that coder decided after spending two days that the original 12 day estimate was off. Uh, and it's actually there's 13 ECDs remaining after they've put in the two. This is a more accurate estimate and you need, to, as a manager, you need to embrace that estimate. You, you absolutely want to get the most accurate version at any given point in time being fed up to you. That is so critical. You need to empower people. You need to tell them it's a good thing when you do that. Now the person might expect some questions, probably not for such a small thing, but they might, if it were a bigger thing, like you, the estimate was 10 and they said, no, it's going to take 30. They're going to get a few questions, you know, their manager, their technical manager, the architects, they'll all be swarming them and say, why do you say that? And that person will have to justify that. And, and that's fine. That's a part of the process. That That's absolutely fine. But uh, it has to not be a punishment in any sense. It's like, this is great. Um, the attitude is it's fantastic. We now know more about the real world that we didn't know before. And that needs to incorporate back up into the plan. And so that's what this re-estimate does.
So as you continue logging effective coder days, day after day after work day, and you know, these are work days only, so weekends aren't, aren't shown here and statutory holidays aren't shown. It's only the work days that are shown. Uh, and the remaining estimate goes down and down and down. And, uh, and so at any given time, we can see what the time spent to date plus the remaining looks like. And that's great for like a post-mortem. Started at 12, it wound up at 17 is what it actually took. How did that happen? By the way, the same sort of time tracking data can give you the, the coder's W. So the W in this case was, uh, was 0 0.63. Um, and that's, uh, if we look at that, it's just the, the 27, you know, the 17 ECDs spread over the 27 workdays. 17 divided by 27 uh, comes out comes out to uh, 0 0.63. That's their work factor is 0 0.63. So they can like, estimate going forward, I'm going to estimate 0 0.6. Maybe they had an estimate of 0 0.5 before. And well, I'm going to up it to 0 0.6 because it looks like I'm able to, to do that sort of thing. And again, that's the sort of thing you want to come into your plan to refresh your plan. Um, so if we can kind of same data, I just put it on a chart. Um, this line at the bottom down here, this line down here at the bottom is the daily uh, uh, time tracking, uh, um, you know, how much time they put in every day. This is the cumulative amount of time they put in, starts at zero, goes up to 17 at the end. Um, this is the remaining estimate, started at 12, went down a bit, and then no, it went up, and then it went down and went down. Oh, no, it went up a bit, uh, and, and, and down and down and down. And this uh, top uh, line over here is the, is the sum of those two, of the, of the time remaining plus the time to date. And as you can see, it started at 12, um, went up to 16, got a little bit more optimistic, uh, and then got a little bit more optimistic. At one point, we thought it would be done by 14, but then not, 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 went back up to 16 and eventually wound up at, at 17 over here. And again, this is something you can use as a post-mortem. You can get together as a team. You can explain, well, you know, you hopefully you added some little notes as you as you updated the estimate and you can go back, well, why, why did you think? Why didn't you think? Again, non-confrontational, but a great qualitative way of closing the loop. And just, and it's, it's not with a blame, uh, with a sense of blame or anything like that, that you're doing that. You're doing that just to, just the, the act of discussing it, of talking it out, is going to make you a better estimator going forward. So that's what you can get by, by measuring, by defining the things you're estimating as things that you measure. You can go back and compare what, what you estimated to what actually happened and get better at the estimation process. I should point out there's another popular method of estimating called abstract story points, which is popular in the agile, especially agile scrum community, where you have a unitless thing where you arbitrarily say, okay, well, this piece of work takes five abstract story points. And then you ask, okay, well, this next piece of work is that, how does that compare to that previous piece of work? Is it twice as big? Yeah, okay, so call it 10. How about this other one? Okay, it falls between, call it 12 and a half, something like that. And you never have any units that are, it's just kind of arbitrary. And then you measure your the velocity of your team, and it's not of individuals, of the entire team, and how many story points per sprint are you getting done? I despise with a passion that method. It breaks that fundamental principle is you can't measure abstract story points. By definition, you're not even allowed to measure your abstract story points. Because you ask, well, what does that correspond to? Does it, what do you mean by size? Is that lines of code? You no, know, of course not. Is it function points? No, of course not. Is it the amount of time it takes? No, you can't think that way. It's not time units, it's abstract story point units. Okay, well, what are those? How do I measure them? Oh, you can't measure them. Don't measure them. Um, and it that confuses way too many things together. It, it, it brings in your estimation inaccuracies. It brings in uh, how many hours people work. It brings in their productivity. It brings in like, when I said we were, were our, my ECD estimates are like three things that you 
confound together, you know, the inherent size of the thing, who's going to work on it and their productivity. Abstract story point confounds about 10 things together and you can't separate them out anymore. Uh, and so I find it hides a lot of things that you could use to improve the process. And that's exactly why some people like it. They say, that's managers, that's none of your business. Uh, just uh, trust us. But I find that's a real problem. The whole problem with the abstract story points and the scrum methodology that only plans out the next sprint or two. It's like, well, hey, but when is the whole thing going to be done? In, you know, Will it be done in six months? They said, don't ask. It'll be done when it's done. That's part of the, it'll be done when it's done uh, idea, the whole abstract story point. So uh, I despise it. I've tried it. I've, I've been hired into an organization which was heavy in scrum, heavy in abstract story points. I said, oh, great. You guys are good at this. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to be part of that uh, uh, as well. And it was a disaster. I could never, it was the worst professional failure of my life and that I couldn't do what I normally do, which is bring sanity and bring predictability to the process. It was just, and like, it wasn't me. These were guys who were doing it before. It was a team of like a hundred people who were doing this before. And it was just, a, it just wasn't working. And they were good people. They just, they had the wrong methodology, if you ask me. So abstract story points for the birds, if you ask me. Maybe we should make that the title of this video. At any rate, Thank you very much. That was my little talk about uh, estimation uh, and, and why it's important and, and how to do it. Um, again, uh, thank you. Uh, please uh, subscribe, uh, push the notification button, things like that. It's been a pleasure. I'll talk to you next time.